Thank you very much for coming today, many of you yesterday, to uh, uh, this wonderful uh, exhibition of the Mantas and uh, We're going to make it rather informal because it's a Saturday afternoon. So I think the main purpose of this uh, discussion is for the uh, audience in Hong Kong to get to know the Mantas better, to have more of an insight of uh, of his work, of his background, of, of uh, the references that he uh, operates with and that inform uh, the film's own view. So it is indeed to offer this uh, kind of uh, contextual data that is, we believe, not necessarily uh, not essential for, for receiving the work, but certainly uh, helpful in the process of, of, of uh, um, getting closer to the uh, to the artistic process behind them. Um, so I will start with, maybe because of the rather provocative title of the exhibition uh, about films, uh, and provocative because it might seem um, you know, the most direct title that I could, uh, I could think of, but as claimed in the uh, text of the exhibition, it is not particularly accurate the exhibition is in fact not really about films. Uh, to the extent to which the work of the Imantas is not uh, a self-referential uh, analysis or gaze towards the medium itself. Uh, it is an instrument that, that does much more than that. Uh, I believe. But um, I don't want to make my introduction too long because we're uh, going to have the discussion and I would like to ask the Imantas how uh, how did you encounter film, or how did this come into your practice? Um, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for inviting me to come to Hong Kong already the second time, which I really enjoy, and I'm really to do this exhibition uh, here outside. So it's been a pleasure. A bit louder. Ah, okay. Just and um, <laughs> so I just thanked uh, Crossman for inviting me. <laughs> And uh, my encounter with this film, as probably uh, most of my generation in uh, East Europe, of course, was through television. So uh, television in the late 60s, early 70s, when I was a kid, uh, was something really exciting. That was really uh, uh, the, the kind of outside world, is the distant box which arrived to home, our home it arrived uh, when I was four. I really remember the time when it arrived. It really opened uh, this kind of, uh, I mean, the world started to be media. Before it was kind of radio, books, of course, but generation of my parents. But I think it's me, this first generation in the Soviet Union, which was really grow with media, what we consider media, electronic like media. Uh, uh, and that, I think, um, these years from since I was five, four, till um, my studies was very uh, influential, mainly starting with television, later going to the cinemas when I was in school or a student. Um, because the films which we have seen on the television mostly produced in the Soviet Union, in the different parts of the Soviet Union, which are now split into different countries, uh, were very rich. The language of the uh, Soviet cinematic language is very rich. It's really, uh, I would say, experimental. So that even went to the everyday image. So like newsreels, um, TV programs were, I mean, compared to now, were really experimental. The way it was cut, the way it was edited, it was really kind of, uh, I would say, coming back to uh, 20s avant-garde or something. Yeah, it, that's cool. It, that's cool to the very pop, 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 So that was my first uh, encounter with moving image and films. Well, because you mentioned obviously the uh, the start and experience in the. In the Soviet times. I'll ask a question that, uh, or, or I'll open up 
a subject that I think was opened and, and probably like marked a good part of your career and I would bring myself in as well, mine as well, because we both hail from the same uh, region of Europe, from, from Eastern Europe, that is probably more than a region, but for a, for a good part after 89 or 91 in your case, uh, became almost a genre, itself, a genre of, of Eastern European art with its own networks and with um, a set of, of, with the vocabulary, with uh, a set of expectations on behalf of the global art. So I would like to ask you from this perspective, how did your uh, evolution as an artist was influenced by growing up in the Soviet Union and then finding yourself and then finding yourself in this uh, realm of Eastern European art. And then, in your case, and in the case of other artists, but certainly not of all the artists in your generation making a step further or, or lateral step of stepping out of that uh, network and of, you know, of that genre. How did that uh, inform your work? Well, um, this kind of soft, the, the wave of soft revolutions in um, in uh, Central and uh, Eastern Europe uh, caught me when I was a uh, third year student. I mean, I did study a little bit later, not starting from 18, but uh, so just I was in, this, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the in the academy and uh, uh, actually we stopped going to the to the lectures, we went to the streets. So that was the main change, you know, because we thought that life is happening more there than in the classes. And suddenly, <coughs> immediately after one year of this, our four year coming back to the school, to the academy, uh, it was completely different. First of all, it was completely different education. There was not this rigid politicized uh, line. I mean, the Marxism was out of, uh, which is actually quite sad. <laughs> it was too early. Yeah. But I mean, there was not this kind of. Uh, um, Kind of uh, strict, pan-academic, you know, this sort of realist, art-based uh, education, copying nature and so on. So nobody knows what is art then. Suddenly, the history of art uh, come to us. I mean, this development of the 20th century, because I think in the Soviet Union, officially, that was stopped this 20s, 30s. So after all the developments after the 20s, 30s, uh, were kind of not really discussed openly, but not in the part of the programs of education. So it suddenly came. I mean, and you thought, well, it's all I mean, you know, you, what you can do, it's all done. You cannot do anything, you cannot influence. At the same time, there was a big attention for the so called uh, Soviet or post Soviet art. There was big exhibitions made by a few. I think one of the first time was in Oxford, then uh, kind of in the museum. Yes, and then there was these big exhibitions made of uh, so-called that time post-Soviet art, which I think was still Soviet art, uh, but it was really like labeled, and I uh, um, full exhibits full of signs of uh, stars, red uh, colors, <laughs> and uh, I don't know. You probably not, don't remember these exhibitions, but they were really popular. Some artists went. Uh, really but this is, I think, familiar because that is, you know, strangely, the, the uh, uh, there's a similar moment in, in, in Chinese art of roughly the same moment. So there's an interesting parallel of uh, you know the evolution of roughly the same generation in, 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 in China and Eastern Europe with a number of notable differences of course that also inform the, the differences in the different kind of changes that occurred in Eastern Europe and China of course. Well, I've seen few artists, uh, Chinese artists showing um, internationally who are kind of stressing their identity, I mean to history or uh, kind of identity and uh, I think they're already kind of more deconstructed in that sense. I think the beginning of the 90s, Soviet art, post-Soviet art, was more really about signages. I mean, it's more like kind of expansionist, exoticist, and, uh, and um, um, yeah, not very critical about it. I mean, there was like really loud art, you know, like, uh, about poverty, about um, uh, well, but it's not critical. I mean, it's not deconstructing the um, kind of means of what they are using. The, the signages were kind of the same as they were used. The underground sort of art, the sort of era, which is kind of underground. Anyway, but what I'm not wanted to say at that moment, 
what you use the term East Europe, that term didn't exist then. There was Warsaw Pact. There was Warsaw Pact and there was Soviet Union, or basically Russia. Didn't I mean these terms which we are operating now? They really kind of invented uh, uh, during the 90s or even later. I mean it, uh, it's a political term Eastern Europe now. I mean then it was only geographic and uh, mm -hmm. merely used. So what we find out our generation in that uh, particular period that um, we are on the kind of white territory, this erased history. So the um, tough 20th century took out history from us and art history as well. We are what nobody on art history and not much in history itself. So we had to recreate our national, well, national narratives and um, to start something. At that moment, I did locally, I mean, in my country, a uh, statement which was uh, very rude to my older colleagues, but I wouldn't do that again, but I did openly say, because there was no circumstances for uh, free exchange of ideas, there was no uh, possibilities to travel, so there was no art. You have no art, you've been not artists. You've been service for the state, the designers, the political like political designers. All that. I mean, that was very rude of me, but in a way I think it was very, or partly true. And um, we had to reinvent um, art history. I mean, of course, referring to the practices of, from outside and ideas of, from outside, but mainly to what we would uh, refer locally, I mean, like or from our own perspectives. Um, of course, some artists, and they were successful, I mean, in the Central Europe, they start to refer to the main trends of the contemporary art, and basically to the conceptual, or the Zari, or the, you know, the minimal art, and they became successful, I mean, like, connected that kind of modernity, and, um, but some others, uh, I think, it took more time to appear for those artists on the scene, really revisited their history. And um, the art history, I think, was very poor in these countries. I mean, except the official art. And um, the thing what we could refer on was history. So history became a narrative. A narrative which you kind of started to deconstruct. I mean, I did and uh, some of my colleagues did. And, um, um, so other spheres of the life, like design, uh, architecture, fashion design, music, was more kind of um, source for inspiration than history itself. I mean, than the art, uh, art, art uh, history itself. You, because, you know, the, the statement of uh, the artists in the Soviet times not being artists but servicing the, the regime and being designers of the ideology of the regime. Don't you think that in a different way applies to us and to you maybe as well? Uh, with what no, we I, I say you were very creative people as well. I mean, this is another thing. You are not artists, but they were very creative sometimes. Sometimes yes. not. I mean, the, you know, the nuances came later, but. Um, no, but in the sense that, you know, what we do is also we, we service and we, we create uh, uh, a you know, self-serving image for the regime that faci facilitates, you know, the situation of having this kind of institution in Hong Kong, of you being here, of me being here, of, you know, uh, our audiences hailing from different places and coming together under this uh, language of contemporary art. Isn't this you know, also an image of the kind of economy and society that we, we, we live in today. And, you know, isn't this in the same way, you know, serving that, that image of the society? The same way in which the Soviet Union was, uh, uh, you know, glorifying the working classes and that was reflected in, in painting that was doing just that, our uh, economic and political system glorifies movement and flexibility and uh, circulation and de-essentialization. And that is exactly the kind of forms that we find in, in today's art and what we call contemporary art. So, you know, maybe provocatively as well, but isn't, you know, even if the two regimes may not be the same, but the kind of relationship between artist and the regime might be analogous. No. 
<laughs> of course, you can make parallels because we are uh, in relation to the to the well, to the power structures. You know? Well, it's one power structure, it's another power structure. It's one economic power structure, and there was political power structure. And uh, of course, it's only in relation. I mean, it's uh, relative, and um, and there could be parallels. Or, uh, but uh, I think um, also some fundamental differences. I mean, first of all, I think um, during this uh, former regime, uh, we could not discuss, we could not compare <coughs> so different practices. The practices was given upon you could in kind of uh, add to it your own sort of style, but not your own statement. I mean, talking about the official art, or then later kind of more or less liberal, and then the visual arts. Maybe some other media, especially music, was much more free, at least in Soviet Union. Uh, film, I would say, was also more free, but uh, visual art was very regulated, regulated and controlled. I mean, controlled by. I mean, I can't imagine somebody, a group of people, maybe very respected, coming to my studio and saying. You know, you should do this way. How did that happen? I mean, that was very normal because so many. No, but did it happen to you? Were you already in that? Uh, no, no, no. To my all the colleagues. I mean, yeah. the Soviet, but it was very normal. You know, like the, the. I mean, the, the representatives of the artist union is coming and uh, checking the kind of how your 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 artist life is. I mean, how your practice is going. You know? So, I think there is limits or the, the differences. Uh, where kind of your rights are obeyed and where it's not your personal kind of individual rights, individual freedom, you know, and uh, or settlement. So I wouldn't say, uh, I wouldn't do a parallel. I mean, it's very, it would be probably not fair. So you mentioned that history uh, became the matter of for, for your entire generation and it certainly um, certainly for you as well, and like this is something that we can see very well in the exhibition. But I think it's interesting that the three films deal with it in very different ways. Because the first film, uh, The Role of the Lifetime, uh, is in a way an, an, an anti-statement that because it almost proclaims the impossibility of, of, of recreating history in film or the impossibility of, of bringing these two realms that are unstable, both unstable, the, the realm of film and the, and the realm of history, and bringing them together is, is, is again impossible. Then in Disappearance of a Tribe, you have history there. It's the, the, the materials are pure history, you can say, and the, the challenge is to bring it in filmic matter. The challenge is to uh, bring it into the realm of cinema. Whereas in Restricted Sensation, you are actually recreating or trying to recreate a historical era. So almost the opposite of the, of the disappearance of, of, uh, of a tribe in terms of relationship between history and film. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, yes, uh, you know how does this work for you? Uh, how can you, uh, you know, how can you? What? Well, the first one it's maybe easy, but I'll, I'll ask another question uh, later, or it's from this point of view. But how can you uh, recreate an, an, an era in restricted sensation? Like, what does it entail? Especially an era that you that you that you lived uh, yourself, and then. How do you bring something that is so historical, something that is quite alien to your own uh, persona, the disappearance of the tribe, the second film downstairs? How do you bring that into, you know, uh, uh, the cinematic realm that, you know, by definition has to have relations with the present as well? Well, I mean, again, starting from the first one in the exhibition, I mean, the, the, which is based on the <coughs> conversation I had with um, English. Make a video workings, um, which is edited as a uh, monologue of his. And um, he is talking about what is representation within uh, 
good image for film. And uh, even he's considered to be a beginner of uh, uh, cinematic reenactments. Uh, it's a Culloden or uh, uh, the, war, the war game, even uh, the Forgotten Faces, probably that the first kind of very clear reenactment in the cinema. That's 59 already. And uh, I mean, he's been a pioneer of many things. But anyway, I um, talked to him about this kind of thing. Okay, just a little. All right, I talked about his kind of, I mean, he's already like 70 something, 80 now, and uh, he had already entire his life in the, in the film. And um, how he would define the film, and uh, what he considers to be a documentary film or representation. And finally, it out, I find out, I mean, I think it's kind of obvious in that, because it's so very subjective. So it all goes through the personality, I mean, through the ethics. So ethics, uh, kind of um, individual ethics, sort of, uh, is the, the, the main kind of, uh, kind of code to, to personalize this group. So you are ethical towards what you know and you are ethical with what you do in the way you present it. So there is no other way. And he calls it responsibility. So this first film, I mean, The Role of a Lifetime, is edited in a way, that's already 10 years ago, 2002, 2003, um, through the Peter Watkins uh, explanation of uh, what he understands about film, I edited it in a way what I thought about that. I was very rude in a way, but I think I was also very ethical. To what uh, I mean, I think it's very respectful ed ed kind of edit of of, of his um, of his um, kind of view on film. And uh, did this he see it? what <coughs> did he see it? Yeah. Yes. And well, I mean, he's never happy. <laughs> so, uh, he's, uh, he's that kind of person. I mean, this is why he 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 has what has driven him to make this kind of extraordinary films, you know, extremely experimental because of his character. But, I mean, he's never happy. But once, uh, I think one of his representatives, I think he, he, he never had a really long-term working person with him, asked me to include his uh, this film into, into the kind of DVD set of his uh, filmography as extra to, to the war game, I think. And, um, but then I didn't uh, agree with that because I, I still, it was very, I just, film was just made, I didn't want to kind of make this so cinematic kind of, uh, uh, you know, it's not really, it's, I, I would consider this still video installation. Yeah. And um, it didn't work. And then two, late, two years later, I said, well, your decision it was so good because this man from Canada is so bad. You know, like, I mean, whatever, I know. So, <laughs> yeah, so he definitely saw the, he did, he did see the film and uh, um, yeah, he did. And then there's, um, in the middle, there's The Role of a Lifetime. It's my kind of homage yeah. to, this appearance of a tribe, but there's my kind of homage to probably a little bit what I was saying at the very beginning uh, to this disappearing media. I mean, I, I was saying about television, black and white television, and a certain kind of style of uh, which were, the images were kind of constructed in the television of the 70s in the Soviet Union. So this, my attention is to the homemade photography, the amateur photography, um, which was um, uh, still very different, I mean, extremely different how images are circulating now. Because this analog um, image is made by the people themselves in the, in the rooms, back rooms, and uh, um, it's really like all this kind of um, kind of entire circle structure. You know, they, they buy materials in, uh, in, in the shops and they photograph. They buy cameras. They photograph. They develop. Uh, they set the they pose for the. Their friends, they give camera to other one and explain how they want to uh, see themselves in the in the images. This is really a big attention to the particular moment. This is all about, I think, analog um, culture, analog 
image making culture. This is importance given to the moment. Of course, it comes from the early photography when the weddings only or you know, funerals or newborn babies photograph. But I mean, there is already kind of free. You can make images almost as you want, as many as you want. But still, there is such an important for this um, particular moment when the picture is made. So this kind of difference of attention to the moment and with the digital uh, image making, which is um, even if it is a single image like photography or video, it's all about recording. So recording is not a moment, it's more about flow. And uh, this disappearing culture of uh, importance to given to the moment, so disappearing of a tribe is not about the disappearance people who are gone, I mean people always die. But, uh, uh, this disappearance of this particular culture of self-representation uh, at a certain period, like starting from late 30s, 40s to 80s. So that's the time of where the images are. Yeah. And of, they are taken from my uh, family archive, so it is a you know, storyline. But for me it was this construction of images through uh, kind of black and white homemade photography. And the third film is um, well this is kind of extension of um, what we still kind of consider um, documentation in the film. I mean I made 18 films here and three. So there's like a kind of a big jump from 2005, which is the disappearance of a tribe, to 2011, six years. And um, because I introduced really like this kind of uh, uh, means of uh, fiction film into, into, into practice, because I still consider that there are some elements which make it uh, to be seen as documentary. Uh, what we consider documentary, or there's a kind of aspect of, let's say, um, interpretation of truth or uh, kind of reality. I mean, using Peter Watkins' words, because documentary is impossible. Again, it's term. So, if it's so, then it allows you to use more um, um, strategies in this kind of representation. And the um, last film, which is um, uh, which is in this exhibition, and also it is my last uh, film I, I did, is basically uh, again made according to research I did um, of the of the gay uh, kind of on the based on gay a gay issue and uh, because in East Europe it is extremely um, negative um, kind of um, negative uh, approach towards uh, gay uh, culture and uh, in general about feminine it's really like uh, um, something un un so antagonistic and uh, 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 um, kind of hard to understand why it is, so I went to, 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 do, to, to do this research and uh, to see why and when this kind of, um, kind of negative um, um, came. I mean, and I think very important was for that two things. First of all, it's Catholicism, uh, like the parts of the kind of traditional set of the family. But uh, ironically, also Soviet era, which was very much anti-religious, uh, was uh, during that time what criminal, uh, the, the, the gay um, uh, homosexuality was criminalized, and um, that made me so um, kind of um, fascinated because I saw parallels in um, just for persons for for certain people being. And homosexuals excluded from the society and very similar to the culture or political residents. So basically, they like the political uh, 
residents equally uh, or very similar to a gay uh, people who were driven out completely their civil rights. So up to they couldn't uh, defend them, themselves in the, in, the, in the courts. So, I mean, um, um, and yeah, so then according to some sort of witnesses, I uh, kind of wrote this script and uh, tried to create the atmosphere of the, of the 70s on the example of this uh, young artist, uh, young uh, kind of director, the other kind of uh, assistant of the director, and uh, um, as the probably metaphor for uh, otherness in general within uh, kind of uh, certain political circumstances. And uh, for me, first of all, this film is not about uh, probably gay. Uh, issue is about being individual artists, being mm -hmm. a creative individual, with the example of um, of uh, of a homosexual. And also here is in the film, it is even not really clear if the main character is homosexual. It's sort of um, it's unimportant. It's not even important yet. Well, at the end, it's not the most important thing. It's most about how you consider somebody, you know, how you categorize somebody, and how you give this kind of um, um, yeah, I mean, kind of social kind of um, punishment or whatever, you know, that uh, is, is because of somebody being difficult, and um, that was that has happened during that time to many artists, to many intellectuals. Uh, many political residents and gay. So this is a fiction, and I think, looking from today's perspective, what is the kind of driven sort of force of this? I think film is absurd. So what you see there is just absurd. I mean, looking yeah. from today's political residents. What do you mean by political residents? Dissident. Uh, dissident. Dissidents? Uh, political dissidents? Dissidents. Dissidents. But I would still force it to be uh, a bit to, to describe it from a even more, or like I, well, I, I won't force it, but uh, I see a more subjective component there. And I, I would make a parallel with uh, one of your uh, best known films, which is Revisiting Solaris, which is also a very for the audience, a very um, complex short film that well, Solaris uh, de departs from the from the uh, film by uh, Tarkovsky from the 70s, Soviet film, um, which was well, based on the on the book of, of Stanislav Lem. So it's one of the iconic uh, films based on an iconic book of science fiction, of 20th century science fiction. Um, and uh, the Imantasis video brings the main actor from this iconic film, who was actually Lithuanian, Donatas Bionis, I think. Yes, Donatas Bionis was, you know, a star of Soviet film, um, and of course he's an, an older gentleman now. And together they walk in the the Imantasis in the film as well, and they walk in the this very 70s setting of uh, interior design of a, of, a, uh, of a building that used to be the KGB headquarters in Vilnius. To television and KGB, I mean, yes. So yeah, so locations. an organ of repression. Uh, but the film also contains like early 20th century drawings of an other, of a, of a Lithuanian Photograph. artist. Photographs of children. Yes. But, uh, so it is again a collage of, of many issues of, of a historical uh, of a historical change of a, of a projected future that is uh, of, a, of a projected future of the 70s that was sublimated in the in the science fiction of the of the time, but was also reflecting the goals of that society that was lost. The actual setting where they where where they talk to each other is also a reflection of that vision of the future with this modernist design but also with the failures of that 
uh, of that era. Um, and it also has like a very personal story because you see this uh, uh, actor who used to be a handsome man and was a... Uh, he still uh, is. He is, <laughs> of course, uh, yes, but he was indeed uh, one of the stars of Soviet cinema and he's now well in the 70s. I but what I'm interested in now is on your position because Leimantas appears in the film but his presence in, in that, you know, 70s transported in, the, in, in, in a present that was imagined uh, from the 70s and the 70s also like brought into the actual future is that of, uh, of, of the contemporary perspective. Even if that was your era and, you know, uh, you have seen that film in a, in a different circumstance that the Soviet era is part of your biography and you're not in your 20s. Uh, but still, your position in that film is that of, uh, of an agent of the of the present, of the contemporary. You, 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 because the actor, Bionis, is the one who embodies in himself both ages and you know the hopes of the of, of his youth and the, and all the failures that happen in, in between. So he's the uh, holder of that history, whereas you're you know present. Whereas in this film, you don't appear in the film itself. But in my view, that actually puts you in a more complex position because you are, um, by not being you know, present in the film as Deimantas Narkevich, who's the artist of today making the film, you are much more present in that era. And that era that you reconstruct becomes uh, more strongly embedded in your biography. I would even say that you know, it's easier for one to speculate and to identify with the character in the film. Um, well, I mean, uh, even this, um, as you say, I think I, I mean, I pay a lot of attention to recreate this seventies era, even visually together with the team, we spent so much time, so much money on kind of recreating, uh, interiors recreating the outfits and, and so on. <laughs> we need to, um, to kind of get into this. Um, but then we find out, I mean, and I knew this from the very beginning, that it's not the visual recreation that recreates the, the, the kind of um, what was actual then, I mean, what was kind of the problems of the past. As, as long as they are actual still today, I mean, it's, as long as they are interesting today, so the, the, this past makes relevant. And um, even the visualization, we find out that using only kind of uh, relics of the past will not represent the past. It will be another kind of third sort of layer. And um, I introduce components which are coming from today, I mean, like even the costumes, uh, it's like, a, I don't know, mixture of uh, vintage things and uh, kind of contemporary brands, which are clearly visible. I mean, I mean, well, not clearly, but they can be traced that they are, I mean, jacket from the 75 and the trousers from 2009, and uh, things like that. And also music. That's because the 70s are back. So, <laughs> <pretty small. laughs> it's also, you know, like it's for this you know, and the, the French label, and um, also the the music, the music is sounding, which is uh, created today, some of the music, and uh, um, so the criminalization or oppression on somebody who is a different the society is not um, the issue of the past. It's taking different forms today. And I think in that sense, the past is uh, somehow uh, actual or somehow uh, relevant today. So the, the kind of um, set, social sets, so, 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 social priorities, or um, sometimes could be seen as uh, cliches or political correctness is a result of the, of the development from the past. And uh, I think the traumas or um, oppressions 
from the recent past have really reflected on uh, on the, on today. And um, in that sense, you could see it's autobiographic, autobiographical because I I lived in both kind of different eras, and uh, I see so many components uh, still there today. And um, besides that, the uh, political system changed completely from socialism to capitalism, neoliberalism. I think there's more capitalism there than here, in a way. I mean, what I understand about social care, and the education system, and so on, so I think it's more wild in East Europe now than it is in Hong Kong. And um, from, uh, so let's say, it's this from the kind of free market, I mean from the control market to the free market, from the, from the controlled ideology to the kind of new liberal, do what you want, you know, and nobody cares. And, uh, but still, there is um, so much of um, um, particular things which come through the traumatic history. I, I really like the, the writings of, uh, of uh, Boudin, Boris Boudin, Boris, Boris Boudin, because there is some few essays uh, he write about what makes the United Europe different. So we have the same television channels, we have read the same books. I mean, even the education is kind of, now they read the same critical literature. And um, there's no border, there's no Berlin Wall, there's the same economy. Some East European countries are doing than the former Western European countries. I mean, like Slovenia is doing better than Greece. <laughs> Lithuania is doing better than Iceland. You know, like, uh, and Latvia is doing better than Ireland. You know. so, uh, but still, it's, it's, a, it's a great difference. So, in which sense? So, the only past makes the difference. The presence, I mean, it's the same. And uh, I think that's also relevant in terms of Hong Kong and China. <laughs> and, uh, and the differences. But okay, I think before we open it to the public, I'd uh, just uh, I'd like to ask you a question that no artist actually ever enjoys answering. But what would be the colleagues that, uh, both in, in, in cinema and film and in visual arts, that you appreciate the most? Uh, and, you know, ideally from a point of, uh, you know, ideally colleagues with whom you also find uh, some common grounds. Besides of my generation? Or not necessarily. Not necessarily, but ideally active today. Well, that is a very complicated question. It's very complicated to answer. Of course, the, I, I was uh, 10 years ago. Um, I really enjoyed to be in the exhibition created by Katrin Romberg. How's it wrong? Where did I meet first time? I think. At this session. At this session, yeah. yeah. Where, where I've seen, I, I, I know those people a little bit. I mean, I, I think I have met about, uh, like, Kirji Kovanda, Yuri Skola, Tomislav Gotovac. Uh, that was kind of, you know, you, you kind of find what you reflect. I mean, you, what you kind of were thinking. You, you see that. So, very, uh, the 70th Eastern European generation. Yes. I mean, this. Uh, oh. These people were kind of uh, kind of ni nice discovery, but then I mean not to m I mean I already mentioned that uh, a chance to to meet uh, Peter Watkins like again starting from 2000 and uh, talks with him and um, TV sessions we had it was really nice. And, uh, I appreciate him. So he's still he's not making films. He made a statement that after the La Commune he's not making any more film which is from uh, uh, 99, but he's alive and he's uh, writing. I don't know, well, it's just so many good people, <laughs> and, uh, good, uh, or bad people, but good aunts. <laughs> On this note, uh, we should open it to the public if there are questions for the Matas.
maybe on this discussion they can like it louder. <coughs> maybe extending this discussion on the uh, recreating a certain time. I was wondering how do you position yourself to differentiate from an epoch film? No, of an epoch, a film that recreates epoch. an epoch. You know, like you know, a war time or the Elizabethan times. So. <laughs> you know, like what? What? Go with it. <laughs> or go with the way. <laughs> like what? As an artist, and in your way of appropriating kind of like this form of trying to represent a certain moment, is not or is uh, related to the epoch film, to the genre. You mean how I view the genre of yeah. the retro kind of. Uh, uh, there's so many, I mean, it's the entire genre in the film industry of retro films. Um, some are, I think most of them, not, well, some are very successful, some are not at all. And, um, but I think the most successful ones are where our epoch is projected from to the past, to the means of the past, the, and the tools of the past. So I think this, my intention was also this, this that film, to see um, uh, the past from the today, uh, understanding that uh, kind of different sensitivity probably uh, it was not not noticed yet. Uh, it's it's really like a, um, the film, for example, this the aesthetic sensation is is uh, it's very criticized in Italy. They did get any distribution. Which was surprised for me for, for kind of cinema. It was in the festivals and uh, all possible festivals. And why event. So this is why, because they say you are not correct to the epoch. Because you say, I mean, the um, and they criticize many details. You know, like for example, if the guy in the prison is and you can see still the. The, 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 the pants are iron. It's not possible. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, you have a, a song kind of this sort of, sort of tropicalia, the beginning song, when the guy is fixing the, the radio. You say, like, no, no, no. The, in, the, the people of uh, kind of uh, who are sort of. Uh, have Complex the kind of officials. They would never listen uh, to that kind of music. <laughs> <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> you cannot, but, but, I mean, this and, and many, many. I mean, like I think film people. I mean, they are, they look to. Uh, I mean, they're too much into the technology of how to make. Films and, uh, but anyway, I read it with with fun, this criticism, you know, because I I'm so happy that these particular details made, I mean, I can't imagine like the uh, film critics are saying, you know, all oh, the trousers of your main, or well, not even main character, are too much iron. So how precise they were to, to, to watch the film, you know? And, um, but anyway, I mean, this I think is different concepts of looking at the, at the, at the past, you know? And I think, there's still kind of two concepts of looking at the history. It's like seeing the history like a, a linear sort of, you know, like linear, linear coming from, I don't know, sort of ages, whatever, Roman, whatever, coming to today, and you sort of arrive where you are led from the past. But there's another way of seeing history from today, and you reconstruct all the kind of lines. You are where you are, and the past is kind of seen from the perspective of today. And um, I, I'm on the favor of the second concept of looking at this group. Other questions? In, in the same vein, will you consider that um, reenactment or, uh, or form of reenactment in artistic production will be to, to constantly kind of make the time present? In a way that by bringing elements from the past, from the history, from various stories, 
you win. I mean, you make it again on the table, on the discussion, on view, and with a constant uh, presence and maybe as such as the generally present of the structure. Um, well, there are many ways to organize uh, reconstruction for the enactments. There is cinematic enactment, there is like performance as the enactment. Um, there is a theatrical enactment. And opera is so constantly the enactment itself. I mean, so nobody expects in opera a new twist in the in the kind of. Uh, it's just all about how it will be performed, how high it will be, how low, or how. I mean. So, um, but bringing the political event as repetition, I think. Um, I would think that one of the best probably examples how affected it was was the um, uh, reenactments by uh, a British artists who will represent Britain and next to Venice Vietnam. Jeremy Dallas. Jeremy Dallas. Jeremy Dallas. Uh, the, 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 the better probably. Yeah. So it's basic. So basically it is really like a uh, re-filming or re re repeating how media of that time looked at them. It's not reenactment of the, I mean, it's also kind of, let's say, reenactment of the events, but basically how the media <coughs> looked at that time. So it's basically repetition what reporters of some 20, 30 years ago seen the event. But also by doing this kind of in a relaxed way, I mean, without any tension, so basically, it takes the political weight of the world. It's kind of, um, it's not really deconstructing the kind of, uh, but it's really taking the tension away and fo making the focus on something else. Probably, um, yeah, it's really deconstructing the certain uh, political event and uh, bringing the other discourse to it. And I think the strategy of like Jer Jeremy Dellert did or Peter Watkins did in the uh, late 50s, 60s, maybe it's already kind of um, explored itself. Or, uh, but I think there will be different forms of uh, bringing representations of the past. Not the past itself, but the representations of the past. Um, and I think to me, the opera is the best example of it's a kind of entire industry how to perform as good as the mid 19th century. <laughs> See, there as there's so limits on how it should be sang, how it should be kind of staged, but it's still considered as something happening now. Yes. Yeah. Uh, by the way, just before my question, I'll just comment that I think opera is expanding in extraordinary ways when you have what Peter Brooks does, what William Kentridge does with opera today. I think it really is extending well beyond trying to duplicate 100 years ago better. But um, I, I was interested in the disappearance of a tribe being a dif disappearance of sort of curated moments, if I understood correctly. Curated, self-curated, captured moments. Self-staged. The the, the um, when you were talking about disappearance of a tribe, referring to the disappearance of that sort of recording of moments, which were Fixing. many photographic moments. The photographic moments, which in a way were were self-curated, considered moments that were constructed by the people who who created them, for the most part. Um, yet we seem to be at a time now with sort of a narcissistic avalanche of multiple moments and multiple you know, recordings of everything, as much as anybody can, can do. And I wonder if that's going to not necessarily be so bad, but it's going to demand new ways of translating it years from now as to what this period was like. Just a different way of approaching it. 
and what you thought about that, with how that may transform how one looks back. Oh, well, I think, I, like, as I just said, I mean, it's really like a different approach to, towards uh, the time. The analog photography is about the moment, about the importance of the moment, of the, that particular moment when the image is taken. I mean, how the appearance is orchestrated, you can say. When the, with the digital uh, record, it's really nobody is dressing up anymore for, uh, for the homemade uh, images, you know, like it would be very strange. Uh, because, because it's like, uh, it's, yeah, it is uh, a different uh, concept of uh, making it as a record. Even if it's a photography, I mean, it's a shot, but it's a record. And, um, and you don't think that's still happening with digital, but just overwhelmed by a lot more and a lot more moments in time? Well, I mean, that already is kind of changed completely. I mean, I change. I, I see I clicking on my cell phone, I mean, which I wasn't doing when I still had uh, uh, 35 sure. millimeter uh, camera. But I think um, it's all kind of, we can't, we can't go back. No. We can't go back. We just can refer to the past. Mm -hmm. Also, to the attention of image making. It's kind of, I don't know, I mean now there are so many people who are still carrying, uh, I mean, what is this, Lakers, but they're clicking like the same life. Yeah. And um, there are people who are making uh, videos of the home, home events, like weddings, and they st still stand for a while, you know, very nicely dressed in a nice environment. But then it's, it's, it's like mimicking of the, of the moment. It's not uh, because they don't care what kind of sun or what kind of um, uh, light is, or what is the black and white photography. People are waiting for the sun to come out or, or just to be a kind of uh, not so frontal sunshine. Or some, I mean, this kind of, I mean, it's gone. I mean, there is gone. You know, we, we can't. Uh, we just can take into consideration, probably, uh, to kind of educate ourselves. There's other possibilities to make image, even with the contemporary. Uh, Any other questions? If there are no other questions, I'd like to thank you, Daniel. Thank, thank, thank you all for this. I mean, thank you for the talk. And uh, the exhibition is downstairs, so uh, it's a good moment to see because yesterday it was uh, packed at the opening, so I think it was quite difficult to see the films.